Good morning. How's the greatest church in the world doing? Man, I'm so glad to see y'all. We still have a couple of chairs in the front. Uh, if you if you need one, some off to the side. How many of you know at Coastal Church, you got to get here early to get a back row seat, right? Bunch of backslidden Baptists, uh, uh, tons of us. So anyway, glad to have you uh, today. My name's Chad, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are thrilled to, uh, to have you. Pastor Bryce already talked to you about our Connect card, but what I like to be able to do is every week, whenever you turn in your Connect card, that's also the same time when we take up our offering. And I like to let everybody know where we've invested some of your tithes and offerings this last week. And by the way, I, I need to hear a strong shout-out to everybody that was at the Christmas party on Wednesday night, all right? All right, dude, how many, uh, I mean, we had a blast. It was hilarious, and uh, we, we spent a ton of money on food, and, and we had a DJ and everything like that. Now, let me tell you what's so cool, because you remember how, how I've been telling you, hey, generosity begats generosity. Whenever you decide you want to be generous, God sends people around to, uh, to bless you. And so uh, we, we had it on our hearts, man, we're going to have this huge party, and uh, our DJ was there, and... Um, and how many of you know he started off like with some 50s and 60s stuff, which was, you know, okay. Some of our older folks, they, they kind of like that. And so uh, I went up to him after a while. I was like, hey, dude, you know, you can, you can crank it up if you want to. And then uh, he said something that I can't say in church. And he said, well, Blake, let's crank this thing up. And then all of a sudden, ACDC, you shook me all night long, uh, goes over our church Christmas party. And so, uh, and, you know, we just kind of laughed and just said, all right, well, uh, maybe I should have been a little bit more specific. Um, but you know what happened at the end of the night? He was so inspired by you guys as you were up doing the chicken dance and the wobble and, and all the other stuff. You know, he, uh, he, he took the check and he tore it up. He's like, man, <laughs> I'm going to try to do my best imitation of a strong southern accent. He goes, man, I ain't never seen no church like this. You guys are awesome. He starts tearing up and he goes, preacher, I may need to talk to you in a couple of weeks. I was like, that's totally cool, you know. And he says he's going to come check us out. But here's what's so cool. I, I was just reminded the other night, uh, he was so inspired by you guys, your sweet attitudes and, and the way that you love to be around each other and the way that you like to celebrate together, that this dude just said, hey, man, I want to give back to, uh, to you guys. And it wasn't, it wasn't a little cheap check. I mean, he was charging us pretty good. But here's what I want to let you know. Ladies and gentlemen, this holiday season, everything that you do matters, okay? Don't pass up the Salvation Army bucket, all right? I mean, don't pass up an opportunity to give because God wants to bring generosity back your way during this holiday season. He wants to show, you, uh, show himself strong and mighty. What, there's nothing cooler, by the way, than preaching to people while they're eating popcorn. I just want to throw that out there, all right? And as we're, we're sowing into you guys and you're sowing into the community, how many of you know God is looking at each and every person wanting to remind you this, this Christmas holiday that he's got all of the challenges that we have. He's got it all in the palm of his hand. And he's going to work it out. Thank you so much for your generosity every week. Some of you give online. Some of you do automatic withdrawal. And some of you give at the end of our service. Whatever way possible, thank you that your generosity is contagious and that God's moving. Let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, I love you and thank you again for another opportunity. I have to share your word and thank you that you are going to speak to hearts and lives. If there are people here today that may be in a pause point in their relationship with you, I just thank you for speaking to them. Lord, there may be some today who've never begun their relationship with you or maybe God, there are some that one time served you but drifted and fell away. I thank you for speaking to them, drawing them in by your power and your presence. Your word says it's the goodness of God that draws people to you. And, Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you that it draws us to, to repentance and to a life change. And, Lord, that the rest of our life will be the best of our life because we put you in it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, wow. What's this? This is the North Pole. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Where's the snow? Why are you smiling like that? I just like to smile. Smiling's my favorite. Make work your favorite. That's your favorite, okay? Okay. Work is your new favorite. Fine. It's time for the announcement. Okay. Okay, people, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Santa's coming to town. Santa! Oh, my God! Santa here? I know him. I know him. He'll be here to take pictures with all the children. Yeah! Just keep your receipts. 
10 a.m. tomorrow. 10 a.m. tomorrow. Santa's coming to town. Yes. Can you sign this for me? <gasps> oh, hi. Santa's coming. <laughs> well, welcome to Christmas at the movies. If you're here for the first time and you don't know what in the world we're doing, all right? Uh, a couple of years ago, well, we'll actually be five years, uh, uh, five years old next, uh, uh, this January. And our first ever Christmas, we were like, what can we do that's kind of Christmassy? Because, you know, we didn't have enough people to do a, 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 a cantata like some of us have seen. And uh, we weren't that creative. And, uh, and we were like, what can, what can we do? And so we were praying and I said, hey, look, we can maybe take some Christmas movies. This is our, our fourth year to do this. And, uh, and there are some that will actually uh, do it all around us, we just found out about. And so it was kind of cool whenever we decided to do it. So we've done this. This is the reason for the candy and all that other stuff. So we're calling it Christmas at the Movies. And what we're doing is we're uh, taking some Christmas movies that tell the holiday, uh, the, the Christmas story in ways that we may not understand. The movie Elf. Uh, we love at our house and my little boy, every time we watch it, I have to, rem- I have to rewind the part because he has like a, uh, a really long burp and Evan has to watch it no less than 10 times. And yeah, you know, and he's like, dad, do it again and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I'm getting nauseated. Quit this. I mean, this, this is disgusting, you know, but he, he wants to watch it all the time. And one of the things that we can take from, uh, this movie is that it's all about surprises. All right. Uh, the movie Elf is, uh, it, tells a story about Santa Claus. He's delivering toys to an orphanage whenever this baby crawls out of, uh, out, out of his crib and he gets into uh, Santa's uh, toy bag. He falls asleep. And then when Santa gets to the North Pole, he finds this baby there. And so Santa and the elves decide to raise him, all right? Now, this main character, Buddy, has been under the impression his whole life that he's an elf, all right? And despite the fact that he's so much bigger than everybody else and he can't do the things that the other elves do, he is surprised whenever he accidentally finds out that he's a human being, all right? So Buddy leaves the North Pole to find himself and to meet his dad. And his dad and his family are all surprised when they find out about Buddy, all right? So the movie Elf that you and I are going to talk about today, it's all learning how to deal with all the surprises that the holiday season can bring, all right? And... You may be here today, and you're uh, you're like, all right. Um, I'm usually a very scheduled person, and uh, this holiday season has screwed me up. All right, um, I'm one of these guys where, you know, it's hard to believe that our uh, our our church is, God's blessed us so much. But I'm a I'm really a schedule. I'm a strategic thinker and planner. The other day, I sent uh, our creative team. Uh, our plans for our uh, April series, all right? I just, I love to plan and create and study and stuff like that. And so uh, we always leave room for the Holy Spirit to do something spontaneous, but I like to uh, I like to get ahead of the game. And so surprises throw us off. Maybe there are some of you today where this holiday season has been unlike anything else where uh, you're like, dude, this, I, I, I really need uh, some help today. I need, I need to come up for some air because everything I've planned for has, uh, has not worked out, all right? Today's message is just for you. Now, uh, uh, according to my leadership profile, it says Chad Stafford hates surprises more than anybody else, all right? Because I'm a type A leader and I'm like, I'm kind of, uh, I'm personally, I'm structured. I don't put my issues on everybody else, but I love to uh, to be able to kind of get ahead of the game. And, and they said, man, uh, in dealing with Chad, he hates surprises. And, and for those of us that hate surprises, uh, one of the main reasons why I can't stand surprises is that they can often be embarrassing, all right? And how many of you know that God uses your children to bring in surprises that are embarrassing better than anybody else, all right? Uh, give you a point in case. About a year and a half ago, I, again, my little boy, he's about seven years old. Uh, he's about four at the time, and Jennifer has got some plans that day, and he gets all uh, out of school early. And so I, I pick up Evan from school, and he decides... He, we're going to go watch a kid's matinee, all right? So I get this, and, uh, and I can't do anything as well as his mother 
in his eyes, all right? Uh, and so, man, this day I'm really trying to impress the boy. And, and so we go there, and man, even though he's just eaten like five minutes before, uh, we, uh, we're going to get his snack pack of popcorn and, and Coke, and, and they got those little fruit snacks in the middle of it. And, and then he's like, hey, Dad, I need a booster uh, cheer. You know, these booster. So I'm strategically holding all of this, all right? Because I want him to think, man, his, his daddy can do it all, all right? So we're in there, and I've, I've got him seated, uh, seated. And man, when Evan's in the movie, he's locked in, all right, dude? I mean, he is, I mean, like a samurai warrior, all right? And so he's sitting there, and he's eating the whole time. And how many of you know, when your children do something awkward in front of everybody, it's usually at the most quiet point. Well, we're in there, and, you know, at, at first, I'm not paying any attention. It's a kid's movie, and I've got my phone out. And Evan looked at me and goes, Dad, put your phone away, or they will put you in jail. And so I said, all right, I, I put it away. And so I get a little bit into it, and all of a sudden, there at the, at the absolute climax of this movie, it's as quiet as death. The music has stopped, and so I'm leaning in, and my son, who is not even five years old, Breaks wind louder than anything I have ever heard in my life, all right? And the dude is sitting in the booster chair, so it's only amplified, and it's quiet. And here's the thing. It goes on for like five seconds. I don't know what Evan ate the night before, but he cleaned every cobweb he ever had out of his colon at this particular moment. Now, here's the worst part about it. Who do you think they thought did it? The cute little four-year-old or the dude who's his dad who's rocking close to 300 pounds? Who do you think did this? And as he's doing it, I am yelling at him in the movie. I, I mean, it's going on. I said, have you lost your mind? And with a look of satisfaction that only men can understand, he crosses his arms and looked at me and he goes, nope. <laughs> I looked at him. I didn't know whether to spank him or to kiss him, you know, where, <clears throat> and so, you know, later on, I was just like, I cannot wait to tell your mother this. And so I, I quit trying to compete with Jennifer. Here's the thing about surprises that uh, they can embarrass us and they can frustrate us. But here's the thing that I'm noticing more and more in my life as I follow God, um, God is behind a lot of surprises. And even right now at this point in your life where this could, it's, some of you are here today and you're like, this is shaping up to be the worst holiday on record because of some things that are happening out of the blue that you didn't plan for. Let me just talk to you a few moments about surprises. Number one, surprises will disrupt our plans. All right? In the, book, in the, in the movie Elf, we see that Buddy's surprised to find out he's not an elf, but you know what he does? He goes with the flow. He adjusts with it, but his dad fights this whole thing, all right? He doesn't want another kid. He doesn't want this. His, his whole life is about work, and surprises disrupt our plans. Imagine being, we're going to look at two different things uh, in, in the scriptures today. Buddy can represent Joseph, Jesus' earthly dad, and his dad can represent Herod because they're both surprised. They're both thrown for a loop and how they have, how we react to surprises during this time will show us whether or not you and I are made of much, okay? The Bible talks about this, about the guy, uh, Jesus' earthly dead. In Matthew chapter 118 says this, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing that amazes me so much about Jesus' earthly death. He never speaks one recorded word of Scripture, yet his influence is incredibly profound in the Bible. Okay? So this guy, his life is being planned out. He's engaged. Everything's going well. Everything that is working out just like he planned until all of a sudden his wife-to-be says, hey, look, uh, I'm pregnant. The only problem is uh, me and you have not... Uh, uh, this is from somebody else. And he's confused, he's frustrated. But, how, I mean, how am I going to handle this situation? Somebody got pregnant, uh, somebody got my fiance pregnant by and somebody else beside me. And the Bible says that he planned on doing some things quietly. Now, you and I, this particular holiday season, 
There are some of us, whenever we go and we hang out with our, our, our family during the holiday season, we need to come back and detox after it's all over with. Like, these people are crazy. I know why God sent me to another state. The, uh, how in the world is, uh, have I made it this long? You know, you're dealing with some people that are like, how have you not driven over yourself in a car? You know, I mean, the, and, and, and so now uh, some of us are uh, we're like, golly, these people are absolutely nuts. And, and we need to be able to, uh, to handle this. You know how you and I are going to be able to handle with God's help? It's not giving people the silent treatment. During this particular time, it's simply choosing not to respond or to react. It's just simply being able to say, you know what, dude? Um, I'm not going to take that bait right now. All right? The uncle who's as negative as everything, where if Saturday Night Live were to have a Mr. Pessimistic character, they would recruit him, you know? Uh, or the or the aunt who, you know, <laughs> I mean, if you've got a family member that uh, the only way they know about somebody is uh, they, they will point out the worst thing that they ever did. Like, uh, hey, you know Barry? No, I don't know Barry. You know Barry? The guy that did like five years for stealing a car that one. I mean, uh, I mean uh, you know, they couldn't describe anything else but that. Uh, but the holiday season that you and I choose to not take the bait of somebody and avoid conflict with people, this is first introduced by the idea of Joseph. This guy, Joseph, his life is getting, uh, getting started and working out until he gets the surprise of his life. But here's the thing. Joseph gets surprised and he reacts positively. And then there's this king over all the land who gets uh, some surprise that, that Jesus is being born. And watch the way that he reacts. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now here's this thing about this guy by the name of Herod. All right, He's king of Israel. He's been king for over 30 years at this point. Now, here's, the, here's what we're seeing. He's in the twilight of his life. He was once considered a very valiant warrior and, uh, and is one of the richest men. Historians will tell you he's one of the richest men that have ever lived. And, but he's at this point in his life now where life even surprises him. Uh, he's about 69 years old. He's overweight. He has really bad gout. And he has so many sexually transmitted diseases that parts of his body are rotting, turning black, and infested with maggots, all right? So this is not a guy you want to give a hug to, all right? He's five years away from his death, but he's really already dead inside. He's surprised and frustrated with his life, even though he's accomplished so much, all right? He's surprised that life has become so unfair to him. I'm 69 years old. I've got all the money. I've denied myself nothing, and I'm the most unhappy person that there is. How many of you know there are certain things in our lives that I've met people who are absolutely as successful as, I mean, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're like, dude, I'm the most miserable guy in the history of the world. This is where this guy is. He finds out that there's a new king that's happening. And the Bible says that Herod was disturbed, all right? Herod at this point in his life has sown to the wind and reaped the whirlwind. He's denied himself nothing. He's experienced everything this world has to offer. And he's miserable. He finds out about this. And he does something completely different than Joseph. I want to show you this. The next thing I want to show you about surprises is that surprises may disturb our positions. Okay? Joseph finds out about this. He, he's not wealthy like Herod. He's beginning his life. Herod, you know, at the end of his life, I mean, dude, he's been awful. And, dude, this is one of the most ruthless men in history. The, the history tells us that Herod one time goes away on a trip, and he tells his bodyguard, he goes, hey, look, while I'm gone, if something happens to me and I die, kill my wife, okay? And then later on, the, the bodyguard tells his wife that. And then whenever he comes home, he notices that his wife is somewhat cold to him. And so he kills her, all right? So this is one of these situations. This is not a warm and fuzzy kind of guy. This is a guy who is controlled. He is wealthy. He has everything going for him. But then there's this other little humble peasant guy by the name of Joseph who his world has been rocked. And watch how he responds. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse nine, uh, 19, says, Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had it in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, 
do not be afraid to take home Mary as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Can you imagine what confidence God has in this guy by the name of Joseph that he would entrust him to something this big? Where an incredibly difficult assignment. What incredible character this guy must have had. And some of you right now, you're a Christ follower. You've been hit between the eyes in the last couple of days. Do you know why? Because God trusts you. Not that you're going to fail and not that you're going to fall in every, you're not going to die homeless and penniless and 20 pounds overweight. It's because God trusts us with trials and circumstances. Now, there are some of like, hey, God, I wish you wouldn't trust me so much, all right? But Joseph surrendered so much for what so many seemed to be of so little return. He had to lay down himself. I fear that there's no way I could have done this. He had such immense strength of self. It's almost unheard of. No, what are you talking about? All right, dude, so what? He married a, married a chick that was pregnant. What's, no, 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 no. You got to understand something about Joseph here, all right? Some people just think, well, you know, he was kind of humbling. No, Joseph surrendered his position. What are you talking about? Let me give you some insight on Joseph's social standing. Joseph was, in the Jewish tradition, he was called a Sadiq. What's that? He was like a really glorified deacon, kind of like a lay pastor there at the temple. It's one of the most glorified positions that anybody could hold in the community. It's hard to attain. It had, you had to have great political influence to even be considered for it. These were men, watch this. To be a Sadiq, you had to be a man of absolutely impeccable character. So this dude has this really cool position. Everybody thinks well of him, but all this changes when his fiance comes up pregnant. Guess what happened? He gets removed from his position because they were like, mm-hmm, somebody got caught. Mm-hmm. Messing around, uh uh-huh. Well, guess what? You're not the Sadiq that we thought. Here's the thing. Joseph couldn't even defend himself or even fight for what he knew to be true. He disgraces his family. The surprise disgraces his family. He loses his position. And many believe that both he and Mary, many scholars believe to this day, that both he and Mary were both kicked out of their homes. Can I give you some further proof? One scholar writes this, that one of the reasons why Mary was with Joseph and not with her family registering for the census was because her parents could count to nine. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph just did what God wanted him to do, and if that meant losing his position with society, that was okay. I'm sure he wished there would, could be some other way. But Joseph later on was going to model for Jesus what he was going to say in the garden the night before he's crucified. He said, Father, if there's any other way you can do this, man, that would just be awesome. But you're the boss, not me. And here's what we see. During surprises, you're going to see people that will lay down their positions. And then some people, kind of like Herod, whenever their position is threatened, they run quickly to defend their position. Look at this. The Bible says when Herod heard that uh, all, heard this, heard about the new king being born, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, Herod killed anybody he thought was trying to steal his throne, whether it be somebody that's coming up in the political ranks, somebody that was getting popular. And so he's disturbed. Why? Because if there's a new king, there's new rules. And so he finds, okay, new king? All right. Uh, then I'm, this new king is going to have to get dealt with. All right. This dude killed three of his sons. That he thought that, you know, I've got to fight for my power. I've got to kill these guys off. I realize they're my flesh and blood, but nobody takes what's mine. Caesar Augustus once said of Herod, he said, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. For those of you that don't know, the Jewish people don't eat pigs. All right, so. Got it? (laughs) You're going to live a lot longer if you're Herod's pig. By the way, the other day was kind of funny. One of my buddies... Rabbi David Tokager came over, and, uh, and he called me and says, hey, uh, Chad, I'm, I'm going to come over. Let's have some coffee. And I was like, yeah, cool. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm getting everything ready, and then all of a sudden I remember, Rabbi David's kosher. 
and in our uh, in our office are all these summer sausage logs and like pig skins and stuff. I was like, oh my God, I got to hide all this from Rabbi David. So I told him about it and he was like, you Gentiles crack me up. You know? And so <clears throat> I thought that was kind of funny. And some of you, it, that'll, you'll get it later on when you're in the car. But it says, <clears throat> Herod and all of Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Now, why is, why is the rest of Jerusalem disturbed? If you know anything about Jewish history, the people that live in Jerusalem are the rich religious people. And guess how they stay rich? By do, running a racket on the poor people, on the poor Jews there. Who keeps their lifestyle going? Herod. So they're like, all right, dude, Herod better kill this dude off quick. Whoever this new king is, he better kill him or we're screwed. And so watch what happens here. Herod just kind of tries to manipulate his way in. Look at what verse 7 of Matthew chapter 2 says. says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report him to me so that I too may go and worship him. He's wanting to find out where this new baby is so that he could kill him. We're seeing one person... Lay down his position whenever God sends a surprise. And another person fight like all get out to keep what he has. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Chad, that's exactly where I am. I'm fighting like everything I have to keep what I have. Here's what I want to ask you something. Not prying or getting in your business. I just want to ask you this. Since you've been fighting so much... Has life become better? Or do you find yourself sleeping less, less at peace, and starting to get a little paranoid because somebody may take something that's yours? Final thought. Surprises deliver, can deliver, God's promises. Okay? So Joseph is, he's lost his position. Herod's fighting for his position. Joseph is like, hey, God, You're controlling my life, and Herod's trying to control the situation. And Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 says this. When they had gone, talking about the, the Magi, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I uh, tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Okay? Here's what we got to understand. All these surprises, all these things that could have, could have made a guy run. You know what it did? Instead of running from God, he ran to God. And here's a legacy right now. Joseph, instead of building a name for himself, built a home for God. And sometimes, just throwing this idea out there to some. Sometimes, when you and I lay down what we've always known, God can give us what we've always dreamt of. There was a situation whenever I was working on a staff at a church where my wife and I were being really, really run down. Um, it, it hurt because there was some spiritual abuse there. And we've always loved where we are. And we just felt like, you know, we were just kind of shoved out of the way. But you, what I didn't understand is that my wife and I had been praying for a miracle because my wife was experiencing infertility. I mean, two shots a day in her stomach every day. There's, there's no hope. God had to send us away from Alabama to Arkansas so that I could have my son who embarrasses me in a movie theater. So whenever people say, man, that guy treated you so wrong, you know what I say about that situation? God bless that man because if it wasn't for him, there would be no heaven. Maybe, just maybe, listen to me. God's wanting to work out a situation like that just for you. Maybe God's behind the scenes in all this. And the more we're fighting, the more we're fighting God. And God can't deliver the promise. You see, the, Joseph has this piece that, you know what? God is working behind the scenes. He's, he's got me covered. But then there's Herod. Look at what verse 16 it says. Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi. 
So they didn't go back and tell him where the, where the baby was. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that they had learned from the Magi. This is what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. Weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This was prophesied over 600 years before the birth of Jesus. You see, let me tell you something. The promises of God are going to come true in our lives whether we believe them or not. God will either use you as a witness and a testimony or will use you as an example. Where, you know what, this dude didn't listen to God. His life is awful. Don't you want to be like him? No. You know why my sisters are good and they didn't make a lot of mistakes? Because I made all the mistakes for them. They were like, why in the world would I want to be like Chad? He he stays in trouble. What an idiot. I made living for God so appealing to them because they're like, if I just do the opposite of Chad, I'm going to live long. And you know what? My butt's not going to be near as sore as his. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God is showing that this dude, Herod, he's totally at peace with killing more than a dozen infants. Because he thinks that killing kids are good for his reign and the good of Jerusalem and the good of Rome. Here's what we see. Joseph lays down his position, but Herod is obsessed with keeping what he has. He's trying to hold back the promises of God from coming on a group of people. And the whole time he thinks he's fighting to keep his, what he's doing is he's fighting against the hand of God. Is there anybody today that may need to hear that these surprises that have thrown you for a loop, they could be God. I'm not a prophet or anything like that. I'm just saying, is there a possibility that if you're serving God and you're trusting God right now, could God perhaps be working behind the scenes in a way that we don't know? And Here's the thing, what happens whenever you try to control situations. Let me tell you the end of the story. Herod's kingdom today is a pile of rocks. But the kingdom of God just keeps going stronger and keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you know why? One chooses to control, one chooses to let go. One thinks maybe surprises, this surprise, it may surprise me, but it never surprised God. Here's what I want to ask you before we dismiss today. How am I dealing with life's surprises right now? Are you, like Harry, trying to fight for control, matching everybody blow for blow? Or am I at peace with my life and just saying, you know what, God, I'm tired of fighting. Here's the thing that I've noticed in my journey with Jesus. There will always be circumstances. There will always be things that will try to rob us of our optimism. I never want to lose the ability for God to surprise me. I've got a earned degree from a very prestigious Bible college. I've, I've heard more sermons and been under great men of God. And sometimes with great learning comes great sadness. And I don't want to ever lose that thing that maybe God is working beyond a realm that I don't know anything about. Maybe in all my planning and all my scheduling God may be in that, but God may also want to turn it. And so my life's in your hands, God. Can God still surprise us with his plan? Am I okay with having enough to understand to take the next step and just be happy? Some of us are like, man, if I just knew where God was going to take me on this, God doesn't work like that. When he does, he gives us enough faith to take the next step. Well, God, if you'd show me later on that you're going to lead her to Jesus and heal her and all kinds of stuff like that, I would be more nice to her. But God, she's getting on my nerves. You see, God doesn't, God doesn't work like that. He just says, I need you to trust me in this. Just do what I say, and I'll give you the next step when I'm ready for you to take it. Can God still surprise us? Or am I one of these people that life has to be exactly how I pictured it? Could we today at least be open to the possibility that even in God's silence, sir, some of you are like, you know what, I'm at this point right now, I'm so sick of God's surprises, I've quit praying because obviously my prayers don't go past the ceiling. Could we just entertain the idea that maybe even in the silence, 
God's working some stuff out. We talked last week about how before the book of Matthew was written, there was 450 years of silence. There were no books written. There were no miracles. There was no prophets. It was, the historians call it today, the 450 years of silence. But here's the cool thing. If you study your history, and culture shows us that God was even work, was working even though he was silent. You know why? Your history will tell you from 330 B.C. to 166 B.C. The world was overtaken by a guy by the name of Alexander the Great. And he loved his language. And you know what he said? You know what? Art and stuff are very important to me. So the whole world, he conquers the whole world. Everybody got to learn Greek. You will speak my language because I love my language. It's a beautiful language. So everybody has to learn Greek. Guess what happens? The Old Testament is being translated into Greek during that time. All right? The next empire. All right, finally, we got through this. And still, nothing from God. Then the world gets taken over by the Roman Empire. Now, they're not, they're not artsy people like the Greeks are. These are people that like to conquer and build. And you know what the Romans like to build? They like to build roads. Do you know why? Because their whole kingdom was 2 million square miles. And they had to get there swiftly to stomp out any, any type of rebellion. Because they can't handle anything they can't control. Anything outside of what we plan, we squash it out. So they build all these roads. Some of us think that the most famous saying about about Rome is that it wasn't built in a day. No, the most famous saying about Rome is that all roads lead to it. You know why? Because if they created all these roads where they could run horses on there with lightning speed. Before, before Jesus was born, 450 years before, all the roads were like swampy and filled with criminals. And because the Romans loved to control stuff and they, had, they wanted to get in places fast, uh, you ain't breaking the law on them. They're going to kill you. So the roads are there. And here's what the last part of it is. Around the time that Jesus is born, Caesar Augustus is the, is the leader. And you know what he declares? Insight comes to him. Insight, I believe, that was from God. And those of you that know, uh, love history like I do, you realize he declared Pax Romana, or the, or the peace of Rome. And he said, you know what, I can make more money without having to go to war than I could, you know, just going in and conquering the land and waiting forever to get the spoils from the land. So he just said, man, maybe peace would happen. And from 27 B.C. to 180 A.D., the world was free from large-scale dispute. Some of you are like, okay, Chad, what does this have to do with God being silent? If you're God and you have to get a message to the world that you love them, that they have not screwed up too much, that you have not abandoned them, do you know what you need? You need everybody speaking one language. You need, you need to be able to travel quickly. You need roads. You also need peace where people aren't scared to travel and the word can spread inside of the Pax Romana. You know what happens? The gospel gets spread all over the world because they realize something. Even though God was silent, he was still working on their behalf. Can you imagine now in Matthew, whenever it says that the angel speaks, 450 years of silence has happened. But here's the thing. In the silence, God is still good and God is still working. And guess what happens? Surprise, surprise. How are you dealing with the surprises because what you may be dealing with what you're fighting against right now may you may find yourself fighting against God some of you are like man this is my first this is my first Christmas without my mom and this is my first uh, Christmas without my friend or the, the holidays always make me feel more divorced and you're surprised by what you're feeling right now but the surprise is not a surprise to God and if you'll draw closer to him, you know what's going to happen? It's going to bring up about the promises that he has declared over you that will happen in your life when you quit fighting him on it. Some of us were hard-headed. I, I think I've got a Ph.D. in that. But if you wanted to get a message to the world, that's all you would need. 
maybe for those of us who are struggling and holding on to life as we know it, could we maybe open our minds to consider that if I let go of my plans and surrender to God's plans, I may be more considerably at peace. For those of us who feel like God's silent right now, could we maybe thinking that, just entertain the idea that maybe God's working in a way that you never thought about? I know what it's like to feel alone. That's what the Christmas story is all about. That 450 years of silence, when you felt like you were all alone, God was working behind the scenes to bring about his promises and to change each and every one of our lives. When you and I come to that peace, we quit trying to control everything, stop fighting the plans of God, our lives will be so much more fulfilling. And you know what else will happen? The Gulf Coast will be saved. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you that even in the surprises and in the quiet states of our life right now, thank you that you're working. Thank you that your word says you'd never leave us like orphans, but you'd send the Holy Spirit that would comfort us. And so, Father, it's with that heart that we ask to be reminded of your goodness in a way that, Lord, we none of us deserve it, but... You're so good to give it. So it's with that heart that we approach you today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody moving right now. You're here today and you need to take the next step with God. And there are some of us today, the next step is you need to get your life right with God. Maybe you one time served God, but you drifted and fell away. Or you're here today and you've never begun your journey with Jesus, but it's led you to this point. There have been some surprises that have rocked your world. And those surprises have led you to this moment right here to choose a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you, but if that's you, if you say, Chad, I'm not right with God, would you pray for me? I won't call you forward. The only thing I want to do is pray for you. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? Chad, I'm not right with God, but I, I want to be right with God today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? The Spirit of God's calling today. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Don't you dare leave here unless you know you're right with God. Is there anybody else? Chad, pray for me. I'm not right with God today. Thank you. I want that barrier removed. That barrier is called sin. Now, here's what we're going to do. All of those that raise your hand, we're all going to pray this prayer with you. You're not joining our church or anything like that. You're just getting your life right with God, and we want to rejoice with you, and we want to pray with you a prayer that we've all prayed too. So pray this prayer out loud with me, everybody. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a second. Those of you that raised your hand today, I want you to check on your Connect card that you gave your life to Christ or you, recommit, you recommitted your life to Christ today, and we want to follow up on you. But for my brothers and sisters, you're here, and you're going through something really, really strong right now. These surprises have rocked you, and you just need some extra prayer from your church family right now. You're like, Chad, man, I don't know what's happening. I don't want to fight the plan of God. For my life, for some reason, God's allowed you to come to this so that he can bring you through it. And if I can just pray for you, just for some strength for this holiday season, would you just lift up your hand? Chad, I'm going through some stuff right now. I just need God to surprise me. Father, thank you that you're bigger than any circumstances we face. Thank you that, Lord, in the darkest times, you're there. Even in the silence, God, you can come and surprise us and Make yourself bigger than any situation that we have. We lift you up today. I thank you for my brothers and sisters for their transparency in believing you to do something great in their life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? You are the greatest church in the world. Do you know that? I was a little disappointed there wasn't a lot of candy eating or popcorn in this. I'm going to need you to, I'm going to, need you to improve on that next week, okay? Grab two bags of it, all right? You're paying for this stuff, all right? Hey, let's be open this next week. If we get surprised, maybe today was a little bit prophetic. and Maybe some, maybe today is preparing some of us for some things. But let me tell you something. Don't worry. Let's use our faith, okay? 
There's strength in you, I see it. And there's strength in, in us that we don't see that God trusts us. If our trial comes, it's just God trusting us. Amen? I'll pray for you. Then you can go. Father, I love you and I thank you again for another opportunity I've had today to share your word with people that I just absolutely love and adore. I just pray that this week you give them a great week. Lord, may there be a, a true, tangible presence of God that's leading and guiding them and helping them to understand that, Lord, they're not alone. Thank you that you said you'd be Emmanuel, God, with us. And, Lord, may the surprises that we're experiencing or that we may be experiencing soon, may we just use them as a, as a stepping stone just to trust you more. I pray you bless our offering today. Multiply blessings in the life of every giver today. Lord, give people great encounters with you this week to let them know that you're fighting with them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. I love you. Have a great week.